Come on, baby. Here she comes, boy. The fishermen of Cornwall. For hundreds of years, they've worked some of the richest fishing grounds in the world. When you've got a, a nice bag of fish come up, I don't think there's a better feeling in the world, you know. There's fish! There's fish! It's a way of life handed down through generations. I'll be the youngest in the fleet. That's not a bad status to have, is it? Probably starts the day anyway. <laughs> Woman overboard! Oh, no! Now a sea change is coming, the biggest the industry has seen in 50 years. Fishing is the acid test of Brexit. Taking back control of our waters, a brighter future beckons. It was either vote to stay in or vote to get out, wasn't it? Just get out, like. Beautiful. What's life really like, living and working in the wild west of Britain? Can I ask for a better office? One thing a youngster these days needs is steady money coming in, and fishing doesn't guarantee that. And what does the future hold for this fishing life? Bigger the boat, bigger the balls, mate. Oh, I'm in a gambling mood today, yeah. When you're at sea, fine weather, and there's a bit of fish coming over the rail, there's no better job. There isn't a better job in the world. In the creeks and rivers of the Fal estuary on Cornwall's south coast, an ancient way of life clings on. Okay, we're on tack now, isn't it? OK. OK? Yeah. Under power of sail, these boats are fishing for oysters. These are the last stocks of native flat oysters to be fished in this way anywhere in the world. There were sailing boats out catching oysters 400 years ago, and it's changed very, very little ever since then. Veteran oysterman Jason has been fishing like this for 20 years. This season, he's been joined for the first time by his sister, Nikki. It's like the OK Corral here first thing in the morning, usually. <laughs> so all the dredges are out and everything sat <laughs> settles down a bit. Strict conservation rules prohibit the use of engines or technology. All we can use is a landmark. We're not allowed to use any electronics or anything like that, whether it be two trees in line, a house. Once we find a line of oysters, take those marks and you go back on them. Dredges are dropped to the seabed and towed straight behind the boat. The boat's moving all the time across the bank and the dredges are being pulled along by the wind. The gears hauled up every few minutes. It's all done by hand. What's it looking like? OK. You've got to be fairly fit to be an oysterman. It's all physical work. It's an open boat, so you spend a lot of your time out in the elements. So you've got to have that sort of built in you, you know, to be able to cope with those conditions. I've got six layers on. I haven't come across a day yet where you could take any layer off, like, you know? That's what we're looking for, really. Yeah. You know, that's a, it's a nice size oyster, a decent oyster, a restaurant oyster, what they call yeah. these days, you know? The oyster season is restricted to six months to protect stocks, and it closes today. Nikki's the first woman in living memory to work a whole season. I got through it, so I'm probably tougher than I think I am. I couldn't go back to working in a shop, not a chance. At least out here, I'm OK, I'm free. I've got me boss, but I'm free. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about boss. <laughs> I don't, I don't, you don't take a lot of notice of what wow. I say all the time, wow. do you? In the fisheries' heyday, there were 100 boats working the foul. But volatile markets and fluctuating stocks have taken their toll. Years ago, the oyster fishery used to keep a man in a living for 12 months of the year. You'd work hard in the, in the six months that it's open, and that money that you weren't would keep you going year round, really, if you were careful, you know. Jason and Nicky's is one of only 15 boats remaining. 
occasionally you do get a year where the, the oysters don't grow. If there's no fish or no, no shellfish or whatever, there's no money. Now, with the two of them to support, income from oysters alone is no longer enough. Obviously, you've got to earn a certain amount of money to live these days, and we weren't earning enough money, you know, to keep us going. So I thought to myself, well, perhaps it's time to do something a little bit different. All else fails, everything goes wrong. I always got something to turn to that's hopefully be OK. The Fowl Estuary is a network of over 30 tidal creeks and rivers, forming the third largest natural harbour in the world. With moorings sheltered from prevailing winds, 5,000 boats are moored here. But the fowl is changing. Pleasure boats have taken over. They now outnumber fishing vessels 150 to 1. It's becoming a challenging place to be a fisherman. To make a decent living here, you need to mix it up a bit. We fish for prawns, velvet crab, green crab, lobsters. We occasionally see the, the old crayfish. And later in the year, we'll go after the, the pollock and cod. The Henry brothers, Cameron, Ivor and Magnus, work hard to make sure there's always something to catch. In the river fowl, you couldn't fish for one species all year round. You've got to fish for everything. Otherwise, you'll catch it up and it won't be viable to catch anymore. And you upset the balance of it all. Looking after stock is the main priority. So work a patch of ground here, move on next month, find another patch of ground. So you're not overfishing the ground. Today's first target is prawns. There are so many different depths of water in the river fowl. At certain times on the shallow, you get a lot of weed, and that's like the, the prawns like to cover up in the weed. Tide slackened off. When the tide slackens off a bit, you don't catch so many. I'm always optimistic. Skipper's the other way around. What we have to do now is select the, the best prawn for market. It's not as easy as just catching them. You've still got to handle them and pick them by hand. This is uh, to enable the best price. Prawns fetch up to 20 pounds a kilo, more than lobsters. These shallow waters also act as nursery grounds for juvenile fish. That's where we have a fight with nature now, Freddie. We see a lot of fish in the pots. If we used to put these straight over the side, the seagulls will start eating them. So we have to keep them in water. This is my future pollock fishing, you know, in the winter. Other fishermen don't bother, but uh, I do. Here we go. Swim for another day. Off they go. They're all gone. They're gone. The Henry brothers fish for over 20 different species throughout the year. Their next targets today are velvet and green crabs. The green crab is the shore crab, where the kids use crabbing lines off the keys and stuff. So we, uh, we go places where they don't use their lines. <laughs> There's something else that comes in the pot that you can make money out of, you know? With no market for these crabs in the UK, they eventually found one further afield. Started landing to a chap called Emilio from Spain, and he was coming down to Port Leven, picking up shellfish down there. He said, yeah, you'll take the velvet crab off us. Sitting there in the sun, glass of wine, nothing better, I'd imagine. Green crab pointers. I think for Jay, it was always going to be on the cards for him to get his own boat. It's all he's ever wanted to do all his life. For years, every penny that he earned on oystering has been piled into that boat. He's been so desperate to get the money together. You know, he hasn't been out buying new clothes or 
doing what everybody else does and going out. His life has been that boat. He's got something now to be really proud of. There's the old farm born, nearly ready to go. Just got a couple of small jobs to do and hopefully a couple of days we'll be away. For 50 years, the fair morn fished the Scottish coast before Jason bought her and sailed her south to warmer climes. When we bought her, she was just a bare boat. She was just a wheelhouse and a hull, and none of this, all the masts were all new, the lifting gear, the railings, the winch. We actually replaced the deck from, from up there forward right back to the wheelhouse. It was all new in wood. The boat set Jason back 10 grand. He spent a further 40 doing her up. This is basically the, the wheelhouse, you know, where, well, the nerve centre, as they say. It's a far cry from us bealing the sailing boat. Fishing boats these days are, you know, they're nothing like they used to be in the past. It, everything's very high tech and, you know, there's so many uh, different navigation aids and plotters and 3D sounders and all the rest of it, you know? You know, we're uh, moving into modern times and for the fishing, it, it just makes the boat far, far more efficient, you know. Unlike the oyster boat, the fair morn should give them a year-round income. It's five summers' work. One voyage is now over, another's about to begin. Well, I'm pretty keen to go. It's, uh, it's been quite a long process doing the boat up and everything, so at least we know that everything's done to the best it can be um, from our point of view, and hopefully it'd be safe and, and reliable. We're the only fishing boat up here now, surrounded by yachts. <laughs> it may not look like it, but change has arrived in this quiet corner of Cornwall. When I was growing up, every house out here virtually, there was someone fishing from it. Not anymore. Most of the oystermen's cottages in Coombe have been converted into second homes or holiday lets. I just think it would be a big shame for a lot of the, the fishing communities to disappear altogether. And I, I think they should make an exception, you know, just to keep a few places, especially put aside for the people that are fishing, you know. Jason moved back in with his parents to save money for the renovations and be close to his boat. Now that's complete, he's looking to rent a place of his own. The people that own the houses, if they can make twice the money letting them out for holidays, then they're hardly going to let someone in there for half the, money, half the price. You know, it's, it's the way they look at it. It's business, I suppose. It's easier to find a pearl in an oyster than affordable housing around here, especially one within easy reach of your mooring. I think that house over there has just, just been sold for like a million and a half. So there was no hope of anything like that for us, you know. The majority of the property in Coombe is owned by the Tregothman estate. One of their rental cottages has just come available. That's the one I've asked about. I don't know. I don't know how I'll get on with it, but um, yeah, that would be ideal. We, we could put the boat right in alongside the quay there and clean the bottom off, we wouldn't have to get in the yard, you know, it'd be ideal for our job, but I don't know. It could be a pipe dream now, the way it gets it gone. The estate has shielded Coombe from the biggest excesses of the second home housing market. But further down river is some of the most expensive coastal property to be found anywhere in the country. Rich man's playground. There are houses they do on the front, worth millions, empty. If I lived in a city and earned big money, yeah, I'd buy a house on the seafront in Cornwall and live in it for two weeks of the year. But I tend to think if their summer holiday home is worth one or two million, what is their real home like? They almost live in castles or something. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Green's family goes back 300 years here, long before the first Range Rover arrived. 
Only four fishing boats remain, but the yachting crowd do bring some advantages. My wife Angie sells a, a bit of a quality fish on, on St Moore's Quay. Keep the, uh, the holiday makers uh, happy in there. And it's proved to be, you know, quite successful. Thank you. Peter's a veteran of the Fowl's small trawling fleet. Today, he's fine-tuning his gear ahead of the next trip. There's no magic book for it, really. You have, a lot of it is done through experience. Don't think you can have a few quid and buy a boat and off you go. It isn't going to happen. You've got you've to get your experience under your belt. One link out, one link slack. We have a wire that goes to the bottom of the net and a wire that goes to the top of the net. And you want to keep them, the mouth of the net square. If the wires aren't the same length, the net won't sit as it should in the water. Spot on. To start out fishing, you, you've got to get a border boat and, and learn. Unfortunately now, the money that's involved with the, with the cost of a boat and, and everything else, it's, it's you know, for, for Sam, it's nearly madness to, to even think about it. All right, so you measure it, but it's exactly the same length as this one. Pull it out tight. Jason may be new to the trawling game, but they have a secret weapon. Dad, John. As a young man, he spent the best part of 20 years working on trawlers. Right, and you just cut that off a minute. And we'll measure the length of the net, and that's that got to go into that four feet. It's all very complicated, isn't it, Dad? No, not really. Isn't it? Because perhaps it's just me. If it were that easy, everybody would want to do it. Today, they've got one last job, <coughs> making good the net before the fair morn's maiden voyage tomorrow. Could kneel on there, if it's, made, if it's a bit easier for you. Kneel on yeah. so it don't move? Well, i do it from this side. The fair morn is a family affair. Father has helped son, now brother oh. is helping sister. Pull the rope tight a minute, as tight as you can get in. Nikki struggled, you know. She found herself out of work and she wanted a change in her life, I think. She's up for a challenge. You know, there's the money as well. She's a bit of money in her pocket. So she's more of an independent person. It all seems quite complicated to me. But I don't suppose it is that complicated, really. It's an alien world, I suppose. You know, I, I don't the know The only anything. problem with fishing is you can't afford to make a mistake. This is the trouble. If you make trouble, a mistake, somebody you know, gets it's quite... That's the worst part of it. Yeah. You know. It's all quite daunting, really, for yeah. me. Nikki's never sailed out of the calm waters of the estuary before. The trawl grounds they'll be fishing lie in the open seas of Falmouth Bay. It's just being out further, I think it's quite frightening. And you never know if the weather's going to change really quickly. We've been out in gales before and they're not nice. But outside, I don't, there's more, I feel more vulnerable, I suppose. Don't even know if I'm going to be seasick. No, that's yet. true. You're on the outside, you're going to be really I am been. You must have had some weather out there, Dad. Yeah, we did hit a few uh, nasty ones. I think anybody who says they're never scared of there's a bloody liar, <laughs> to be honest. All right. All right. Cut it off. Nikki's about to become the only woman fishing full time in Cornwall. I think the fishing industry have always had a macho sort of image. You know what I mean? It's been a bloke's domain, haven't it? There you go. It's nice to see a couple of girls in it. For you know, there used to be a couple of girls on the French trawlers who used to come into doing it, like you know. But they were all big girls, like rugby players, you know, not not um, small ladies. <laughs> Many consider women to be bad luck on board boats. I wouldn't take a woman to sea, as in as in work. No. What is that? Yeah. That's a, it's an old superstition, but you know. Me, personally, I, I wouldn't want a woman there. Superstitions. You should never have a woman on a boat. I've heard them. Um, it's really bad luck. Oh, no. You won't do learn the R way. I'm breaking the rules, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people say, oh, well, no, bad luck, women on boats and all this crap, but, uh, you know, we just hope we can prove them wrong. <laughs> Shipping forecast is issued by the Met Office on behalf of the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency. Channel Light Vessel Automatic, North, Northeast, 
1.3, two miles. After five long years and 50,000 hard-fished pounds, today's the day that Jason's dream finally comes afloat. It is quite exciting. It is exciting, but it's daunting as well, but we'll see. Mothers come along too. <laughs> right, mate. See you a bit later. See you a bit later. I'll give you an update. Have an I'll enjoyable give, day. I'll give, Dad, I'll give Dad a ring and, yeah. and um, All right. let him know. Water going for Oza. Nothing at the moment. A few minutes from the mooring, there's a problem. Uh oh. Oh. What's happened now? Engine stopped now. Oh, Jesus. Oh, I do have found this. Yeah, I know you could. I'll have to go down there and have a look in a minute. I've never had this happen before in my life. I was going to say, I... Ooh. I'm sounding good. Without power, the boat is drifting. Is it all right? I've got a bloody good catamaran coming up here. Right, just try her again a minute, Nez. Again? And again. All right, OK, stop a minute. Okay. Turn the engine room lights on again. Yeah. I don't know what's going on here. And again. It's any better. The engine's restarted, but the only safe option is to get back on the mooring to investigate further. Fuck her. Ah, oh, Jesus. Bloody throttle linkage is broke. That's just brilliant. I have to take it in and weld it up, and cut it off, and weld it, re-weld it. A tricky repair job is needed, so for now, Jason and Nikki's fishing plans will have to wait until it's fixed. Variable four becoming southwesterly, or westerly five to seven. Rain or thundery showers, good, occasionally poor. Peter Green is about to drop the trawl for his first tow of the day. Peter fishes his otter trawler single-handed. A cone-shaped net is dropped to the seabed on the end of 250 metres of steel cable. Two heavy doors keep the mouth of the net open. But you can't trawl in Falmouth Bay without one of these, a plotter. It shows you where on the seabed it's safe to tow your net. Like there's a ship's, ship's anchor there, a uh, little shipwreck there. It's not an easy place to work. I mean, the Farm Farmouth Bay was always notorious for, for boulders, anchors, wrecks. For some people, you know, it's, it's, it can be a hard place to work. As a good friend of mine said, three holes in Falmouth Bay, two clear holes, and one looks like somebody's eaten my net, you know. Peter will tow his trawl for the next four hours before hauling. Jason and Nikki have lost two weeks waiting on the engine repair. The delay has made Nikki grow more anxious. I've got every faith in you. It's rather I've got faith in myself, innit? You'll be fine. I always feel nervous. Get a bit of anxiety in me. All right, Ness. Yeah. This is going to test me to the limit, I think. I've got to find a bit of fight in there somewhere. I got it in there, but it is, it's a big thing for me. It's not like being in a sailboat. It's a whole new world. Coming out of the foul now, it widens out, and this area is called Carrot Road. And we got the entrance to the mouth of the harbour, and then we're out in the open sea, yeah. Falmouth Bay. Before they leave the shelter of Falmouth's natural harbour,
Jason needs Nikki to run a man overboard drill. You want to do this bit of drill? Want to do a drill, would we? Yeah. Every year, on average, around 10 fishermen fall overboard. Ready? Uh oh, my God. Woman overboard! Oh, no! Yes, you are a figure of eight. Where in your camp? There you are, that's excellent. <clears throat> I'm quite pleased now. Gives me a bit of confidence if anything did happen. I am, I'm gonna have an arm like Popeye. stuff can kill you like that. This big, big, heavy kick. I had an accident. Came to sea as one, one does. One morning, put the boat on autopilot, stood on the stern and shot, shot the gear over the stern, shot the net away, and I went over with it. And uh, I ended up in the net. Basically being towed, towed through the English Channel at four, four and a half knots. Unable to find a way out of the situation I was in. I shouldn't be here now, I was that close to death. And I, I looked into my own soul. I know what death is from my own personal experience. I don't like talking about it when I'm at sea, to be honest, because it's um, it, it's a personal thing, and I don't like to mix the two. When you fought to stay alive, and people say you get your second win, but when you outfought that extra strength and admit defeat and say goodbye to your family, and thinking about let's get it over and done with and going as relaxed as you could something tells you it's time to go and i was it was my time to go miraculously i got back aboard the boat i had a you know a bit of a bit of luck from somewhere a bit of, a bit of a helping hand from someone i don't know After a five-year journey, they've arrived at the fishing grounds. They can shoot the net for the first time. The fair morn will finally be fishing. The blotter's gone. Bloody thing. Ah. The plotter's gone down. Just boom, gone, packed up and it won't come on. So we're out here now, we want to shoot the gear away, and basically we don't know where we're going to fish because we're fishing blind. Like, unless you've got that, it's enough to try the patience of a saint, isn't it? Oh, I tell you what, you, it is true as well. It's another bell, isn't it? Another bell, and there's no fish aboard. Nothing. Fishing's a physical job, but it, it tests you mentally as well. You've got to have a strong mind to go fishing, and especially when you jump aboard the boat and things are going wrong, it does affect you. You know, it really does. It really does get you down. I think you've got to have resilience. You've got to have that 
if you haven't got that, you just as well go home. I've always looking something different. You've got to be looking out for something that's touring up, mainly for the pocket and for the mind. <laughs> doing one species is not, it's not uh, I couldn't keep doing it every day. I'd soon lose interest. I wouldn't, uh, I'll have a hard job to get out in the morning. <laughs> There's a new fish in town. Well, an old one, but with a new price tag attached. And round here, where there's an opportunity, there's usually a Henry brother not far behind. What we're after there, a Ballon, Ballon Rass. There's only three of us here in, in, in Cornwall that are, uh, that I know of that are doing it. It's just new to us at the moment. Ballon Rass are in high demand from the Scottish salmon farming industry. The Rass is a natural cleaning fish. They eat all the lice and all off the face of the fish. If it's not taken off the fish, completely destroyed the salmon. Until recently, wrasse were only good for bait. But now, at £17.50 per Lost fish, they're the highest priced catch in Cornish waters. But you've got to catch them with care. The buyers need these fish alive. If, if you bring them at the water too quick, they'll get the bends. So they take time to recover. Really How many in that one? Seven. The fish will be landed transferred to tanks and then taken by lorry to fish farms in Scotland. You're trying to look after the fish best you can. As mm. long as you look after them, you can get them there live, with good health, good for the fish and uh, you'll get paid for it. You can check when and where it'll be warmest at piratefm.k.uk on what's set to be Cornwall's hottest day of the year so far. Whilst they wait for the plotter to be fixed, Jason and Nicky are turning back to some old school, low tech fishing. To us, fish is fish. We're not fish snobs. If it's sellable, we'll, we'll try and sell it. It's prime tourist season and mussels are in high demand. Hopefully we can get a few today. Just keep the wolf from the door for a, for a few days longer, isn't it? Muscle hunters. You know, that's what we're after, really. Very popular these days. That's a very popular food. We never used to be able to sell them. Going back sort of 20, 25 years ago, no one wanted them. If we had any sense, uh, we would have started up a mussel farm instead of a, buying a fishing boat. The nutrient-rich estuarine waters of the fowl are the perfect habitat for mussels. That's the way to catch mussels, you know? That's a mussel farm, they're actually farming them. Put a load of floats down, hang a load of ropes off them, put, some, put a stocking full of small mussels on there and they'll just grow themselves. There are two mussel farms on the fowl, but Jason's after the real deal, wild ones. They're free if you know where to look. There's some reasonable stuff there. Fine. Someone's been here already and uh, they've, had a, they've had all the easy ones. I can see a few there. It's a labour intensive job and they're only earning under a pound per kilo, but it's an income and doesn't require a computer. That's what we're talking about. <sighs> It's a prize every time. That is a prize. Are they dropped or no? Yeah, a few more, a few more. Come on. Oh, no, he's coming. <laughs> you try on here. <laughs> One of the good things about Nikki is she has got a way of picking you up when you're down, you know? Um, sometimes I'll, if something happens, I'll get really down and she, she'll try and look at it in a different manner. Isn't I it? like doing this. Oh, yeah, it's I a nice, do. it's a change, isn't it? You haven't got deep think too much. It's quite a simple old job, isn't it? Exactly um, what you need. Breath of fresh air sometimes, isn't it? They've done well today. This lot should fetch them around 150 quid. See the prices of some of these houses in here? Yeah, they're not that good. 695,000, 480,000. 
Waterside Cottage, 375,000. You go back 10, 15 years ago, that would have been like £150,000 house, wouldn't it? Yeah. I went in to get a mortgage and they would give me 160000 That was the maximum. Well, I'd have job by a caravan, you know, a static home for that yeah, down would. here. I don't mind renting a place, but you can't rent a place anywhere near the water um, for... You're looking at at least a 1000 a month. The trouble is, people coming down from London, they're used to paying big buck rents because they got the money up there to be able to do it. There are cheaper options in Cornwall, but few close to his boat. You don't want to come in off your boat after doing a 12-hour day and have an half an hour or an hour drive to, to drive to your house, you know. You just need to really keep an eye on your boat. If you get a real bad storm, you know, you've got to be somewhere handy by to keep an eye on the boat. This is a problem. This in the county I was brought up in, it's, it's entirely different now. It doesn't even resemble what it used to be like one time. It's gone from a traditional sort of community with yeah. the traditional industries to a leisure playground for the, the well healed, isn't it, yeah. now, you know? The sort of people that can afford the prices, they don't sort of mix very well, you know? I mean, you say good morning to them and they'll just walk away from me. So the, the actual village itself is, is gone, really. You could go down the creek and you'd always be someone down there messing around with the boats or, you know, it's always someone to talk to, like, well, now some days, especially winter time, we'll go out and we won't see a soul. It's like the rest of Cornwall is gone, it? It just full up with people that come down here and buy a cottage, make a mansion, you know, moaning about the seagulls, moaning about the smell of fish. Up go the private signs. <laughs> <laughs> I could go on for hours, don't start me on that. It's going to be a lovely day, I think. Best time of the day, no people. Lovely. The plotter has been fixed at last. A month in, and it's only their third trip. For Nicky and Jason, it's a hope that it's third time lucky. I was awake last night, thinking about steering this boat again today. Can, can I keep it on the line, like, you know? Yeah, get the net down, get it all working properly, we'll be delighted. It'd be lovely to see a few fish come over the side. Can we check out water again? Yeah, go on, it's all right, I think. Yeah, all good. the wheelhouse was sort of sat there, you know, I knew where I was going to sea. And it was just a wonderful feeling, you know, to know that you've bought the boat, you've worked on the boat, and now you're going to take it um, and go fishing, which is what it's built for, you know? It's like something that's been a big build-up for the last 20 years, you know, and, you know, a lovely feeling. Early bird catches a fish. Dad always used to say you pass the best fish on the way out. Yeah. They've reached the fishing grounds. I'm going to keep that boat on that line. Yeah, yeah, looking good, yeah, that's all right. Put her up, throw throw up a bit, and went on two and a half knots. Nicky must keep the boat towing straight. Jason will do the nervy job of deploying the net. It's very noisy. It's freaking me out, all that, that noise back there. As you can see, you don't want to be standing in it, like, you know? The fair morn is fishing for the first time. All they can do now is sit and wait. After two hours, it's time to haul. Very much. 
I think that's a dogfish. Right, Nick, just go down there because he's catching up on that thing a bit. Just he's pushing off a bit. That's it. That's better. It's scallops in there. Isn't it? No! <laughs> really? Yeah, there is. Well, I'll be damned. We got a couple of monk, haddock, lemons. That's what we want. Dover What's salt. What's that? No. Yeah, Dover salt. Take He's it. a beauty, isn't it? We're nearly there, but we're not quite there. It's not a lot, but we're going forward now instead of backwards. Uh, Pete Green from St Moors. He's um. He's just towed in, he's towing in into the North Ferry. Must be fish here somewhere if Peter's here. <laughs> what a nice turbot. Beautiful turbot. That is the best turbot I've had in a long time. Look how thick that is. Turbot's one of the most sought after fish there are, especially a turbot in that condition. They make very good money and uh, we don't catch them that often. That's a John Dory. The French call him Saint Pierre, which I rather like. The majority will go to his main buyer, but his wife Angie will take the cream of the catch for the Saint Moore's crowd. She's got turbot, lemon sole, red mullet, Dover sole. She'd have liked some more haddock, I expect, and she'd have liked a bit of this and a bit of that, but I'm a fisherman, not a magician. She'd have to have what I got. She only loves me for me fish. Catches like this don't come overnight. It has to be right. It's quite a science of, of setting up angles of draw doors, warp length, uh, bridle length, which is the and the sweep length, the, the distance of wire between the, the draw doors and the net. Everything has to be right. If any of those things aren't right, you won't you won't fish. The, the gear won't fish. It's a month since the fair morn's first catch. The last few weeks have seen them plagued with more tech problems. They've got into savings to invest two grand in renting replacement kit. Screens are all. 3D's working all right as well, so Excellent. it's good news. Excellent. And now we haven't got this this lot to worry about sorting out. We can get on with what we should be doing, which is fishing, you know? Rough seas are forecast later, but they're under real pressure to start catching properly. I think there's a front coming through, and um, Peter Green's pot gone this morning, so that's not a good sign. Jason shoots the net, whilst Nicky works the winch for the first time. Just watch yourself, your legs away from the drum, like, you know? Yeah. Quick as you can. You've got to have your wits about you on you all the time. I don't know what time are we going to do? Just do it like an hour, I think. Make sure everything's okay. 20 minutes into the tow, something's not right. Look, like there's smoke coming out of here. Hey. Eh? Uh, it's not yeah. looking good. The cooling pump is down to a trickle. When we're towing, the temperature goes up even because obviously the engine's doing more work. The engine is overheating. The water's not cooling it. We're going to have to have the net up, I bet. Another trip is over before even a single fish has been landed. Oh. So you could drop like a stone out here. It's starting to wear on me a bit now, if I'm honest, you know? Yeah. If it don't work for us, you know, we can always try to sell the boat as it is, or, or e even sell the licence off the boat, the fishing licence, you know? How long can you carry on like it? I think that a change of career might be in the pipeline for me. We aren't having no luck with this lot, are we? It's a bloody nightmare.
I've never seen you so stressed in all my life. I, th I thought I was having a heart attack, that's what I thought. It just, like, <clears throat> that, it affected me that bad, and I just... I, I had to get out and get out of there, and as I walked out, I could just feel my vision and all closing. It just went... A few days ago, Jason collapsed in front of Nikki on the boat. I thought I was going to die. You really scared me. I thought I was going to die there for a couple of seconds, you know? When I seen you in that state, I'd rather... Uh, we did went and did something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. When I it know. gets yeah, like I that. I felt like that. It's almost as if we weren't meant to go... That's what I felt. I, I, like, it's like we're never, we are not meant to do I this. I know that's a silly way of looking at it. I know it, it is. I know it's it is. It's a stupid and way of looking at it. think there's been the test from hell, to yeah. be honest. Yeah, it has been really difficult. It's tested me mm. really to, to my limit, you know? Very warm today with plenty of sunshine, highs of 24 Celsius. It's going to be a sunny evening tonight for the England match against Belgium. Quite a breezy night with loads of... Some more summertime is, is like I say, the France, you know, beautiful. You know, yachts, beaches, boats and people whining and dining and, and everybody's having a great time, you know. Angie Green sold Peter's prize turbot for 100 quid. But there's plenty more prime fish for St Moore's prime buyers. This one was just bought by a customer who wants it to take back to her husband in London. So I'll keep it iced in the fridge overnight and hopefully he'll be a happy chappy tomorrow evening. A lot of people have said, you know, they won't eat fish again until they come down to St Moore's and get it from the fish train because they've never tasted anything so fantastic. So, I mean, it's good that people love it and, it, you know, it's, it's a bit of an education for them, I think. But that's what fish should taste like, you know. Got your fish, yes. Oh it's a good job that you did order it though, because I've almost sold out now. Oh. Right. Well, right the on the beach, love. Despite the benefits that the changes in the village have brought the greens, they've come at a high cost. <laughs> the main nucleus of the village is getting smaller and smaller, yeah? and the outside influence is getting greater. But I was born in the house down the road, one of the last people to be born in the village, you know. I think keeping the heritage of the village alive is what's important to me because the village has changed so much in the last 30 years, 30, 40 years. It's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's slowly, slowly losing its identity. If you come here in the summer, you should come here in the winter and see the contrast and see the empty houses and see the dark roads where there's no lights on anywhere. And then, uh, you know, that's Air St. Moors we, we have, you know. I was a fisherman's cottage. Uh, Winnie used to live there. Ever since I can remember, yeah. No, Winnie didn't live in there, did she? Yeah, she did, yeah. She did, yeah. yeah she used to live there. Winnie. Jason hasn't heard back from the estate, but he's come to see the cottage anyway. They were all lived in by oyster people, oystermen and their families over the years, you know. Um, that's what the village was built on, oyster, oyster dredging, you know. The cottage is being renovated. Never a good sign ran this way for prospective tenants. It's another one that's gone, really. You never see another fisherman living in there again. We've all been outpriced by all of it, you know? Yeah. It's a sad sign of the times. Yeah, it is. That's what it is. I mean, now they're just people from everywhere that got no interest in any of the fisheries and couldn't care less about it, I suppose, really. No one will ever remember it, no. you know? had a very big spring tide, so hopefully that'll bring them in. The Henry brothers are swapping the estuary for the open sea. Falmouth Bay is home to their summer staple, brown crab. can I ask for a better office. To me, it's not all about money. It's how you enjoy your life as you go along. Stuck in an office in London or Birmingham, up around there, not my cup of tea. That they can have the earnings they want up there. This is the life I like. On the way out, they empty crab shells overboard to help the oyster fishermen in the area. Hopefully we'll get the oysters something to lay their spat to. Always thinking of doing something, helping something on. Here we go. Bait's coming back. 
Cap one. Cap two. Cap three. Today is good, but it's not been a good summer for crab, with the warm inshore waters pushing them further offshore. We used to get anywhere up to a ton of brown crab a week. This year, the most I'd done was about three, four hundred kilos. And that was our peak week. But changing waters bring new opportunities. Something different in this one. Crayfish. Well, they used to be in our waters lots of years ago. For one other reason, they went. But now they're starting to return. About to be legal, has to come back to there. If I'm old enough to see it, see him come back again. To his landable size. All good and well. These brown crabs will fetch around two pound a kilo. But when the crayfish get to size, they'll be worth 10 times that. I've always thought about tomorrow. You can't think about now and forget about tomorrow. You've got to look after the future. I say that because uh, we're able to carry on fishing like we are. I mean, we're still here. I know plenty of failed fishermen. It's always been hard, but I think there's probably more pressure on people now. You know, more pressure to succeed. And I don't think many people want to put themselves under that sort of pressure in the environment that we work, whether it's a sort of financial environment or the natural environment. It's tough, whichever way it's going to come at you. For Jay, it's always going to be boat. There isn't anything else I can think of anyway that would ever keep him Satisfied in his life. It's all looking good, that is, though, isn't it? It's all right, isn't it? Jason's decided to give trawling another go. She's pretty good to go, I think. You ask any fisherman, they'll say, oh, the fish will come when the southwest wind turns up, you know? It pushes the, the warm water away and it allows cold water to come up from the deep ocean. It brings the nutrients that the fish are after and it'll bring the fish back in, you know? The things are changing. Things are changing. Hopefully we're back we're, in business. We're feeling hopeful, you know? We're feeling hopeful, so... You've Perhaps got to keep this trying. time. There's just a week to go before the start of the new oyster season. Getting some fish now won't salvage the fair morn's first year, but could bring hope for its future. I, I expected a few snags, but I didn't expect it to be quite so hard as, as it had, has been starting off with the boat. It's been a hard, hard old slog, to be honest, you know. But hopefully now, the light is at the end of the tunnel. At least we know now all the gear is working, you know, the frawl's all set up. So we know if the fish are there, the gear will catch it. That day was the first day that I'd actually saw the net on the surface and it was actually floating and full of white. After four months and half a dozen trips, the fair morn finally delivers. It's, it's just a lovely feeling when you've struggled for it. But I suppose at least it makes you appreciate when you do catch, you've got to go through bad, otherwise you don't appreciate the good. I don't think there's a better feeling in the world, you know. All your efforts you've put in and you've towed on the right ground and especially after having so many problems that we've had, gradually end up with the, the outcome we were looking for, you know, it was just amazing. Just amazing, really. We've worked so hard all those hours. This time, we've done it. Peaceful, isn't it? 
Another day, another dollar. Another day, another I'm dollar. looking forward to a dollar. Jason and Nikki have an order for a ton of foul oysters. They're still buzzing with the success of their big catch. You wouldn't believe that a few fish can make that much difference, but they do. I'm a different person now, you know? Totally different person again. I'm back to my old self. It's nice that we've got options now, Nick. That's the thing, isn't it, you know? Yeah. If there's a decent wind, we can come on this job. If um, there's a lack of wind, we can go trawling. Oh, that's David in there. He's... You see him go this morning, did you? He must have no, been gone. No, I didn't. How's it going? The whole of the Fal Estuary fleet is out for the first day of the season. Nice to watch another people work wow. for a change, isn't it? <laughs> Tradition says that the first haul indicates what kind of season you will have. Moment of truth. Looking good at the moment. That was only... Oh, we hardly moved. Mm, it's looking good here. They're a bit in there, there. There isn't enough stress, is there? <laughs> I don't think there's enough stress going on, you know? Having worked across the year, Nikki can now call herself the only full-time fisherwoman in the county. It's been a long, hard road. Lots of highs, but lots of lows, I've had. Oh, it's pushed me to the limit. Mind, body and soul, I think. It's tested her to the limit, I think, sometimes, you know? But she's done fantastically well, you know? It's made me more confident as a person, I think. If I can do that, I think I can do anything. And for Jason, his lifelong dream of skippering his own boat has finally come true. The toughest time in my life, if I'm honest. Really have. On a positive note about it, if you challenge yourself with a different job, you go outside your comfort zone, when it does pay off, you feel better about yourself, you know? It's how we grow, isn't it? Yeah. As people, you know? As summer arrives, Cornwall's small boats take to the seas. Two with a few of these. Often fishing alone, it's a tough way to make a living. Not very good in that one. In decline for a generation. Only three boats are doing it for a living now. Can new blood and new ideas offer new hope? Lobsters in every pot, yahoo!